I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Inevitable, that podcast where we get sentenced to death for following the rules. Because this week we watched I Worship His Shadow. Written by Paul Donovan, Jeffrey Hirschfield, and Lex (laughs) Jigaroff. However you pronounce that. (laughs) Sounds vulgar. Directed by Paul Donovan. And aired on April 18th, 1997. All right, so we're finally doing Lex. The irreverent, breathtaking, one-of-a-kind sci-fi series that aired from 1997 to 2002. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this is the greatest show we've ever watched uh, on Inevitable. I I have no qualms about saying that right now. I'm really (laughs) glad that we decided to do this for season six. And I'm really wow. looking forward to uh, to what's coming up next. You were really hanging me out to dry here, especially since we just spent the last, I don't know, 15 <laughs> minutes both discussing how we dislike this show pretty heavily so far. Really throwing me under the bus here having to say that. <laughs> I just wanted to really get into character with these, <laughs> with the characters on Lex, who are all terrible people. Yeah, they, they are really bringing back that Blake Seven vibe. This show, I will use that word again, irreverent. It's the, definitely the most irreverent show we've watched on this podcast or our others, Zenith the Blake Seven podcast, Trust Your Doctor, or Doctor Who podcast. Check those out. The Lex Wiki is also highly irreverent. <laughs> and, you know, maybe this season of Inevitable will be too. Just as a reminder, this season is the first season of Lex, the first four episodes slash TV movies. Yeah. (laughs) No, no, I mean, yeah. I mean, irreverent is a good description. I think another good description is the one I saw on Reddit somewhere, which basically said it was a NyQuil-fueled nightmare or something (laughs) like that. (laughs) I think another good description is the one you gave right before we started recording, which is that the fond remembrance people have of this show is maybe influenced by the fact that they were, you know, perhaps horny teenage boys when they watched it. Perhaps. (laughs) Perhaps. Look, I'm not going to make, and I'm not going to hang my hat on writing like any sort of grand dissertation or theory on, on this, but... In in my slash our research, let's just say that an overwhelming non-trivial amount of the comments indicating people's enjoyment in this show uh, indicated that the writer derived their enjoyment from the fact that the leading lady of the show was either, uh, quote, hot, close quote, or basically very scantily clad every week. Right. And, like, that's great. You know what? If that's why you like a TV show, that's great. Doesn't mean the show is good, though. (laughs) No, no. And I'll just flat out say it. I thought this episode was pretty bad. Yeah, I'm going to come out and say this, that I think that conceptually, I really like the things that the show seems to be setting up because... And I have to say seems to be because I'm like so completely lost in like the execution that I don't even know if my interpretation of what they're setting up is correct. <laughs> but the concepts, it seems like they're setting up the concept of the universe is pretty cool to me. Like the ideas behind the show, I really like and I'm on board with them. But like the execution somehow misses the mark in every single conceivable way that I find enjoyable. Yeah, I would have to agree. I would, basically, I would definitely say that, like, if someone told me the premise of this show, which is that, you know, Stanley and Zev Zev, um, are traveling in the Lex, and, you know, there's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of sex jokes, that's what I've heard, and that kind of tracks with what we on the episode, Um, and sort of this, like, more comedic and way weirder Blake 7, which is how it's been described to us before, um... If you told me that, I would be like, yeah, sounds good, whatever. Maybe not great, but sounds solid. Um, but the just the the yeah, the execution, like you said, completely flabbergasted me. I just I don't know, even I'm almost at a loss for words as to what to say about, you know, what I just watched. And 
there's a lot more good ideas in this episode, even outside the premise, like the idea of a dark universe and a light universe existing in the mm-hmm. same space, and you can only be in one at any time. And like the League of 20,000 Planets basically being subservient to this mysterious uh, shadow person who lives in constant fear of this prophecy made 2,000 years ago that he was going to be killed by the last person of this race that that he's keeping in cryostasis, basically. Like, all of these ideas are super interesting and, and can lead to interesting conflicts, but, like, are introduced in the most confusing way possible as well. Yeah, the, like... Maybe this is just this episode we'll obviously see in the coming weeks, but like just the schizophrenic nature of the narrative and just like, you know, I never really got a hold of like what this, of this, of, of Lex, you know, I never it, really. It, it took me reading not only the plot synopsis on the website we watched this on, but also bits and pieces of the Lex wiki to really piece together what, what the heck happened this week. Even though I took, let me see here, I took. Uh, like 60 notes on this episode. <laughs> yeah, I have 48, and I'm like, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> you know those, like, I don't even know what these things are or really how to describe them well, but they're like those plastic gel tubes. Filled. Some of them are filled with, like, glitter, and they have, like, a liquid inside of them, and, like... There, there, there's no purpose to them. They're just like a toy or something, or like a novelty item. But like, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, they're like they, they're kind of they slip out of your hands. Like yeah. you can't really hold. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's what this episode is. It's one of those. <laughs> we talked about the prisoner 2009 being dreamlike. Wait till you see Lex 1997 <laughs> being nightmare like. <laughs> And I say nightmare because the whole thing is so dark, too. Like, everything is so visually dark. Right. And it's, it's conceptually dark, too. And, like, people are getting chopped up. And it's like... But it's funny in that way as well. And it's, it is visually dark. That's one of the few things I think I really enjoyed about this episode is that, like, it definitely has that claustrophobic 90s vibe. Like, the visual darkness and, like, just the the endless layers of bureaucracy that you can't get out of. Even the cartoons of the 90s, you know, that I watched as a kid and stuff like uh, Rocco's Modern Life and Cat Dog, they all sort of have that vibe. And it's kind of nostalgic for me, I guess. One of the funniest parts of this episode is, like, how long it takes anything to get done on this planet, like, (laughs) bureaucracy-wise. Like, you have to be sentenced, and then you get sent to another guy who decides you're, like, (laughs) you're sentenced, and then you get sent to another guy to carry it out, like... Yeah. The bureaucracy of the whole thing, like, was. So th- there were concepts through this, in this, that, like, shone through and that were, you know, funny. Like, there's that. And Stanley's character, I guess we should just preface this, is, like, he he's he's the thrust of the show. He, it's, it's, it's him, you know? Stanley's great. If I had to say there's one thing I love about this, it's Stanley. Stanley's just... <laughs> yeah. He's so pathetic, and yet everybody follows. Like he's and he's so pathetic, and yet he is like the core character of the show because he's the only one who can fly the Lex. Like that's just funny. I saw this um, comment on Twitter from um, from uh, uh, Bob Rushy, who's just a guy I follow on Twitter and interact with a lot on there, who likes a lot of the same shows that we watch: Doctor Who, Lake Seven. Mm -hmm. etc and he was like he made this tweet of like villa should have gotten his season of blake seven where he was in charge and he was the you know it was it was him or whatever and like yeah just watch lex like (laughs) stanley is like a a villa but you know in a more comedic world Mm -hmm. so there's that there's that solid aspect to it i guess Immediately right off the bat, I'm going to tell you, I basically couldn't find anything about like why this show was created, who created this show, what they were thinking. All I found was a bunch of YouTube videos of like behind the scenes making of the show, which I haven't watched. That's, no, I mean, it's... I just haven't watched, so like, I'll link them in the show notes. Maybe I'll try watch some of them before next week. It was created by Paul Donovan, actually, and uh, you know, there's an interesting story about that no there's not i don't know i don't know anything there was yeah there wasn't much like about why it was made what influenced it i think um 
It's a Canadian-German co-production with some additional funding from a British TV show for seasons one and two. And then season three, the American rights get bought by Sci-Fi, the Sci-Fi channel, and they put in some money to co-produce seasons three and four, I believe. And boy, does it need money. I mean... I saw a lot of comments talking about like great high budget season one and like the episode opens and you see Kai. You see the actor uh, Michael McManus as Kai standing in what is clearly a cardboard spaceship in front of what is clearly a green screen that has been CG to look like space. I like it though. Um, I like the visuals of this show and... Maybe it's just making me reminisce about when we were watching Blake Seven and old Doctor Who and stuff and the low budgetness of all of that, but I don't know. I think it it's like it is low budget, obviously, and it looks bad in certain parts, very bad in others. But there's something appealing about it to me. I, I, think- I guess it's also like maybe it's the bug theme of the entire thing, like the bug theme spaceships and like everything's insect like. Well, we'll just wait till you learn insects, about the but... insect war. <laughs> I hate insects, as I've said multiple times on our other podcasts, probably not on this podcast before. I can't I think, stand them. <laughs> I think the low budgetness can work if the actors are really selling you on it. And that's like Doctor Who was low budget, but you never cared because like Tom Baker is Tom Bakering it up on screen. You know, Blake Seven was low budget, but um, Paul Darrow and and Gareth Roberts are just going at it on screen. Brian Blessed's going at Gareth it, and this Thomas, I think it was Gareth Thomas. Sorry, yeah. I was thinking of the Doctor Who writer Gareth Roberts. Yeah. Um, and this is just like yeah, low budget. You're like, okay, the acting's really going to carry it. And like Stanley, um, what's his the actor's name? Brian Downey's the only one really selling it here. I'm going to be honest; he's yep. the only one really selling it in the acting department. The other actors are bad. I have no qualms <laughs> about saying that. And it's it's just like this this show. If this episode is any indication, is also really ambitious with what it wants to to show you on the budget that it's working with. Right? It's like you think back to like Blake Seven. And it's like, yeah, it was low budget, but they were also going to rock quarries, you know, landing on planets that were just random, like, you know, brush and sparse forests or whatever, or going to old abandoned factories and stuff where it's like, they didn't bite off more than they could chew. And I definitely felt throughout this episode that like, yeah, they're biting off a lot more than they can chew. You yeah. Have so uh, you have all the different aliens, all the different costumes, all the different sets, all the different computer displays, and it's just like it's a lot. I can respect the ambition, though. You know, I I can respect that they're trying to do that. That they're trying to show their entire. I don't know. The creators clearly have some sort of grand um, universe planned out, and they have some sort of you know, grand idea slash themes slash universal law that they want to portray on screen. And I can respect that kind of ambition. Um, You know, sometimes ambition needs to be reined in. Uh, (coughs) Wachowskis. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I can respect. I can respect. Yeah, there's definitely lore to this show obviously more than we've explored because we've only watched one episode but like it starts on a lore dump which immediately turned me off but like if you like that kind of thing thematic parallels because it also ends with a lore dump (laughs) come on Kia don't you see the cinematic genius (laughs) at play here anyway so we meet Kai Kai is the last of the Brunanji Okay, now it took me six times them saying Brood and G for me to actually figure out what the hell they were saying. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had to look up how to spell it. And so the Brood and G planet is being attacked by the shadow. The, um, his he his divine shadow? Name. His divine shadow. And uh, c- because... There was this prophecy that the Divine Shadow will be killed by a Brunanji at some point in their lifetime. So the Divine Shadow's plan is like, well, if I wipe out the planet, well, guess what? Then there's no Brunanji to kill me. Uh, you know, yeah, I guess I understand the logic. 
Yeah, really taking a page from Frieza's book on Dragon Ball Z, who did the exact same thing. Did it work out for him? No. Oh, okay. I watched like two episodes of Dragon Ball Z as a kid, all right? So I don't know, man. I've watched like all of them. I've watched all Dragon Ball, all of Dragon Ball Z. (laughs) What about Dragon Ball Super? No, no, I haven't watched all of Super. I haven't watched any Super and I haven't watched all of GT. I've watched some of it. Too many Dragon Balls. (laughs) So little time. (laughs) Isn't the plot of that show like you get all the Dragon Balls together, then you get a wish? Yeah, that was a plot for like the first 20 episodes and then it just became like fighting. (laughs) Great. That's an exaggeration, but like, yeah, that is the, the basic premise. So Kai crashes his ship into the control room of the Foreshadow, which, like, if there's any indication that the show is either satire or parody, naming the goddamn ship the Foreshadow, it has to be it. Mm -hmm. And instead of just killing Kai, he kills Kai, but then keeps his body in cryostasis to be reanimated as a personal assassin. Because why? I don't know. (laughs) There's a lot of... um... There, maybe that has to, I was going to say this is like a joke, but maybe it actually has something to do with why this show felt so hard to get a grasp of is that there's a lot of like moments where you don't understand the characters, which is okay, I guess, and can be done well. But it's like, I don't know. I felt there was a lot of times where it's like, I just don't know what's, yeah, what's like, the, what's going like, what's through the these people's motivations minds. for doing things, right? Like, yeah. And that's why Stanley, I think, is great because you know Stanley's motivation. He's just trying not to die the whole episode. He's just <laughs> yeah. like, he's doing everything in his power to not to die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My note at this point in the episode is this is boring as expletive. <laughs> <laughs> well, we smash cut to 2008 years later. Yeah. Where we are at the cluster, the capital of the League of Twenty Thousand Planets. Stanley wakes up in his Star Cops Nathan bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> he wakes up in one of those capsule hotels in. Um, yeah. Is that Japan? Yeah, I think a lot of East Asian countries have them. Yeah, I've seen those. Those are uh, the nicer ones. Look really cool, actually. It's like. Yeah, yeah. but like. The nicer ones. <laughs> yeah. The typical ones are just like, you that's know, like, you're crammed in. <laughs> that's like Coca-Cola versus store brand soda. Like, yeah, the Coca-Cola is nice, but it's more expensive. Yeah. He goes to his, what you can, and this is another reason why Stanley's great is like, you can instant as you see him at his job and you instantly know that like he's been slogging away at this thing for god knows how long everyone's been in his shoes at some point in their life like you know he's on the he's on the job and he's trying to um he's trying to throw little i don't know what they were just bolts or something into like a little <laughs> opening in the ground the, yeah. this robot <laughs> yeah every and everyone's had that experience where it's like you're at work bored out of your mind nothing to do and you just you do something to entertain yourself. I remember uh, right when I was working in this one warehouse of riding the pallet jacks like scooters around. <laughs> a guy actually mm, uh, safe. Yeah, no. Well, a guy. I don't remember what happened to him. I think he like sprained his ankle or something. Fell off of one and <laughs> sprained his ankle. It's me and him riding them around like scooters, and yeah, he got screwed. I didn't. <laughs> nice that's okay I, I permanently messed up my back a couple months later at that same job so yeah the job got you back for that one yeah. back literally yep <laughs> we also learned that Stanley like a true you know you immediately relate to Stanley as a slacker who doesn't want to get out of bed because the the robot alarm is like if you don't get out of bed you will get seven demerits and he's like ah. Uh, it's like, you currently have 990 <laughs> demerits. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a prisoner transport being diverted, which we find out in a minute is what Stanley is, you know, doing at his job. He's supposed to let them through. 
Well, they were like... Well, so everybody greets each other with I worship his shadow, which is weird, like Heil Hitler vibes, but anyway. Be seeing you. <laughs> well, they leave by saying, may his shadow fall upon mm-hmm. you, or may his divine shadow fall upon you. But this lady arrives with a ship, and she's like, hey, let me in. And he's like, I need your access code. And she's like, I don't have an access code. And he's like, well, then I can't let you in. And then his supervisor comes over, lets her in, is like, Stanley, you're being, I don't know reprimanded you got to go to the reprimanding room by the end of shift (laughs) yeah something like that and he's like but i didn't do anything wrong she didn't have an access code and he's like yeah well too bad meanwhile in a giant stadium that looks like the intro to final fantasy 10 but way lower budget it's all cg (laughs) Yeah. And look, just assume everything on this show is CG, except for like the practical sets that the actors interact with, because that's what it looks like. A lot of it is CG, and I, I think we're slightly exaggerating how bad the CG is. Like mm-hmm. for it's this was nineteen ninety seven, so I was probably made in ninety six. Like it's passable. It's okay. No, I wouldn't I say guess. the CG is bad, but it is overused. Sure, it reminds me very much of like the birds, but. Not the birds, Birdemic specifically. Yeah. <laughs> the low budget version of the birds, where like they couldn't afford birds or sets, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, and then they 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 remade that right as a, a quiet place. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Those the monsters in that were like little pterodactyl things, right? If I remember correctly, I, I don't know. There's also bird box, which like, or maybe that's what I was thinking of. Bird box, where you can't open your eyes. Yeah, right? that's bird box. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that like. I don't think it's necessarily clear why it's named that. I don't know. I left halfway through the movie, <laughs> which like, you're sitting there thinking, wait, wasn't that a Netflix movie? Yeah, it was. I still left halfway through the movie. <laughs> Anyway, this is where the prisoners are being put on, quote, trial, unquote. Right. We meet the, like, robotic I'm judge s- thing that, 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 like, judges them. Yeah, this is a judge, jury, and executioner all in one. And it's lawyer. like a hologram <laughs> slash robot and lawyer. I guess it's not perfectly clear, and it doesn't really have to be. It doesn't matter. But, like, I guess the prisoners are, they're not brought in all at once because there's some of them in the dome and there's some of them, like, still being brought in like dead livestock or whatever on that thing Mm -hmm. that conveyor belt thing that they're that they're hanging from this is like robocop humor moment where (laughs) they're all driving past stanley and one guy goes hey wait you're stanley you're stanley tweedle the traitor and stanley's like uh uh no i'm not but then just (laughs) conveniently like the bolt on that guy's like little transport comes loose and it just falls and squishes him and you just see the blood's like spray out the side of him getting squashed and flattened and killed yeah there's a lot of gore in this some of the people are getting sentenced to like have their organs be harvested and you kind of like you see them like it yeah you see the little little organ harvesting machine which also looks to be the most like the least efficient organ harvesting machine i've ever seen in my life but anyway you've seen more organ harvesting machines in fiction Uh, yeah that's unfortunate but uh what? Uh, no, it looks really unsanitary, too. Well, I guess if you're dying, I don't know. They'll sanitize the organs later. Just please. <laughs> Look, if COVID taught me anything. Shine. COVID taught me anything. You just you just spray some like hand sanitizer on that. You wipe it down. It's good as new. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Just cough on it a little to moisten it up mm-hmm. and wipe it down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine like the doctor cutting you open for surgery and then just like <laughs> hacking his lungs out into your open chest cavity oh, like, God. pneumonia speaking of open cavities a satanic cult performs a lobotomy at this point in the episode which sounds absurd and like a joke but it's not no don't don't skip over like they've got a body they've got a guy and he's like 
raging against the machine and then they electroshock him and one of the acolytes goes like shouldn't we like shock him again like what if he's not completely you know reset what if we haven't completely wiped his mind and the other guy goes yeah we'll just risk it we don't have time (laughs) and i'm like that's not gonna come back into play reminds me of that guy in blake seven i forget which episode it was in but it was the one where they go into like this alternate universe ruled by like an evil mad god and they're escaping, and they, they ask one of the characters of the week, like, hey, like, you want to come with us? Like, every, everything's about to collapse, and if you don't come, you're going to die. And he's just like, you just go ahead, I'm fine. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, wait, I actually do. It's coming back to me. Oh, my God. I didn't even remember that episode existed until right now. Yeah, that was the one where there was, like, there was no set. It was all just sort of in this yeah, dark it was like a space. Dark corridor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, they like lobotomize. Well, so first they they have this guy do some sort of weird, you know, transference thing to the new body, and then they lobotomize him, and the new body wakes up and immediately goes, "My new body was not fully reset, so I am born of both the divine shadow and my previous host." <laughs> like, oh, okay, right, and that's how you know right off the bat that this divine shadow is going to do things a little differently. He's going to bring some changes to the Shadow Proclamation. It's not actually called the Shadow Proclamation. I just wanted to get that Doctor Who reference in there. They do at least organically introduce the idea that the Divine Shadow reincarnates. Sort of. Yeah. They have like hundreds of brains of previous Divine Shadows. They also really clunkily deliver the exposition that the Divine Shadow never leaves uh, the capital planet, the cluster, which like really begs the question, why didn't they reset this guy's mind like at least a day in advance before the previous Divine Shadow died? Like, why did they procrastinate? We, he's literally on his deathbed like, transfer me, transfer me. And they're like, oh, shoot, we haven't prepared the body yet. A lot of the exposition in the show is really clunkily delivered, whether it's through dialogue or, um, you know, the lore dump narrations that we get. Like, and there's a lot of lore too, and that's a really, in my opinion, unenjoyable combination. <laughs> you don't love the really clunky, like now sen- sentencing of Zev, which we forgot Zev's first scene on the prison ship when, like, the prison guard looks at her and goes. I've met many women in my travels and you're the <laughs> ugliest woman I've ever met. Like, jeesh, jeesh, man. Like, I get that he's the evil imperial guy, but like the guy, the people writing this episode sat down and wrote that and were like, yeah, I'm going to keep this in the final episode. Like, yikes. There's this, there's a weird thing. Let's just talk about it now, even though it's, we're not fully there yet of like, to me, this, it was a little weird how like, the the episode it's yeah i can see how like you know people on the internet or people who watch this would would say this or think this but to, like the episode itself seems to be promoting like because first um what are, what's her name zev is like she's overweight and then like later on she transforms into her actual actress or whatever who is not overweight and like the whole vibe of it is like yes this is like this is awesome you know i don't know it was a little weird it's, to me it's it's weird too because the episode is really in disagreement with itself over that because on one hand it's like yeah it's awesome we can turn people into these uh beings of sexual perfection but on the other hand they're sentencing her to like a lifetime of sexual servitude like she the reason why she's undergoing this process is because she failed in her wifely duties so they sentenced her to become a sex slave basically for the rest of her life so they have to turn her into this hot woman you know depending on your definition of hot so like it really seems like the episode doesn't really know what it wants to say but then really leans into the like this is awesome later on when they like i'll just forget that she went through this process because she was sentenced to being a sex slave like stanley's like oh this is awesome yeah it's like kanye right where it has that like he has that like glimmer of i don't know realization but then it just (laughs) doesn't it just loses it (laughs) But it's also weird because when you see the footage of her um, uh, failing in her wifely duties or whatever they say, it's like the husband was a little kid who took one look at her and was like, wow, she's really ugly. Like, 
There's obviously... Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, like, misogyny of this society is on heavy display here. Yeah, and, like, why was it a little kid, you know, maybe we'll find out, maybe that's, you know, part of this universe or something that we'll find out later, but, like, it's her husband is, like, is, is a little kid. Like, he can't be older than, what, maybe 12 or 13? Yeah, I don't is know. That... They also really like sentencing women for failing their wifely duties because uh, Jigarada gets sentence for that later too yeah meanwhile some other guys being sentenced i couldn't tell if this was taking place in the same area or not but like this guy comes out of sort of an insectoid yeah capsule. Thoden. Thoden, right and he's on trial for i don't even know something that seems to be know. more of more purport than the rest of the people or something like that. Well, I mean, Jigurata committed uh, genocide, right so word. like... Of more uh, import, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, I didn't remember that Jigurata committed genocide. So this guy, just a bug, crawls out of his nose. I bet Keon loved that scene. It was um, awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Keon's going to love this show, I can already tell. Just for the bugs alone. <clears throat> so a bug crawls out of his nose. Turns out it's a bug bomb. And for the next five minutes, we just hear bug bomb, bug bomb, bug bomb, flying, bug bomb, now flying, bug bomb, target locked up, bug bomb, error. Bug bomb, reset, bug bomb, self-detonate sequence, activate, bug bomb, flying. Because he's clearly... Clearly, actually, I say clearly, and I just realized it's not clear at all. He's controlling the bug bomb somehow. I don't know. At some point, Stanley smacks it down. Yeah. Yeah. Its mission is to go blow something up, but Stanley ruins it all because at this point in the episode, Stanley has gone to uh, receive his punishment, and he asks what happens if he's late, which is an even more severe punishment. I think it's like he's... If he doesn't show, he gets killed. Right. And so I think he's weighing in his mind, like, should I just ditch or should I, you know, flee society or should I just go to it? Because when, if he if he goes to his punishment, he'll lose an eye and a, a leg or something like that. So. He'll lose one to three organs depending on uh, supply and demand. And he said demand is high right now, so probably a three donor. He said an eye, kidney, and a leg, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. He can't make up his mind, and so he decides at first that he's just going to flee and then at the last minute he's like no no it's fine i, I want to go through with it but it's too late the, they've already closed up shop and as soon as they do yeah. he wanted posters appear with his face on them all over the place he basically makes the calculation that it's better to lose three organs than to lose your life which true um but yeah then he smacks the bug bomb down then the bomb eventually makes it to its destination, blows up. Uh, Foden had actually been sentenced to having his insides eaten by a cluster lizard, uh, but the bomb releases the cluster lizards upon the cluster, so now there are just cluster lizards running rampant around the planet slash base, which conveniently allows, which conveniently kills the person running the, I don't know, sexifying machine that Zev is currently inside of so she escapes and at the last second she um she, she gets locked in there with the head of a cluster lizard and gains cluster lizard powers because of the, literally the shittiest superhero origin story in existence <laughs> <The Borad. laughs> she's like the Borad from from doctor who you know yeah, except not, like, physically deformed like the Borahead was. No, no. She also, at the last minute, throws, like, a robot head. I don't remember exactly what the sequence of events here, but, like, she throws a robot head onto the machine, so it gets, it, like, falls in love with her as a result of that. Yeah, why it does this, why she did this, how this even works, completely unexplained. That's fine. Completely not important, I guess. <laughs> That's fine. That's, like... On the lower end of my complaints about this show, I guess. But 790 is madly in love with her. Like, we say he's in love with her, and you think, oh, he's just, like, he's infatuated with her. He's like, I will kill anyone who comes near you, kind of, in love yeah, with he's, her. Yeah, he's literally madly in love with her. Like, he gets mad 
at other yep. at, like at I don't even know why he gets mad. He's just mad at like I guess the life. fact that yeah, just at life. <laughs> Anyway, she's walking through the hallways, Stanley's walking through the hallways, and a couple of security guards are also walking through the hallways. Security guards that look like Black Manta from Aquaman for some <laughs> reason. They're on to Stanley, though. And actually, they're not on to Stanley. They're on to, to uh, Zen, or Zev. Yeah. But then they're on to Stanley. Because he's like, hey, look, Zev's here. And they're like, oh, look, it's Stanley. And he's like, no, wait, no. Oh, my God, it's Stanley uh, Tweedle. <laughs> Literally the whole episode, all the criminals are like, oh, my God, you're Stanley Tweedle, the traitor. <laughs> he's like, uh. <laughs> Foden has also escaped. He is wearing a bitchin' kilt, I must say. He's wearing a rainbow kilt. He goes and frees all of his followers too. They obviously have a little, uh, little master plan that they're enacting. Well, they might have a master plan. <laughs> a little unclear given what happens to them. Kind of seems like they didn't really have a plan. This is the point in the episode where I started to not understand what was happening and lose, <laughs> lose track, lose the thread. <laughs> Because the, like, temporal consistency of the episode completely falls apart at this point. Conveniently, at the same time, the Divine Shadow is just having this really weird spiel. It's like, do you think time flows in a straight line? Oh, right. And they're like, yes. And he's like, do you think time must always exist? And they're like, yes. And he's like, how do prophecies work then? How can you know the future of time always moves in a straight line forward? Therefore, prophecies must be false. And everyone's like, okay. Yeah, that's like, that's the moment where like, I don't know, maybe some people have had this in real life where it's like, you're in a room and you think everyone in that room is, is a normal person like you. And then slowly you realize that like, you got a John McAfee like tier person in that room along with you and it's a little scary. I appreciate that you picked John McAfee as your, <laughs> as your outlier. <laughs> you know about his like life right <laughs> like his... oh yeah he definitely killed a man <laughs> like, <laughs> and got away with it and also like just okay we don't need to go into it but i mean yeah i'll put i'll just i'll put like a link in the show notes and people can go read about when it. he unsuccessfully sought a a libertarian party nomination for president of the united states Wait, you in... didn't know that no i didn't yeah, he tried to run for president, and everyone was like, you know, John McAfee, like, probably killed a man, right? Like, we can't, we probably shouldn't nominate this guy for president. He's like, I'm going to try anyway. The last, um, the last thing I read about him, or heard about him, really, was, like, did you read that, like, really big article that blew up in, like, maybe 2013 about, like, him and how he, he his life and, like, I don't remember where he lives. I think it was Belize or something like that. Yeah, it was Belize. Sounds yeah. right to me. Yeah. I'll link that in the notes. It's old and it's pretty well known, I think. But man, it's a wild ride. And also like yeah. the whole, the oh my God, this is all coming back to me. The quantum suicide <laughs> thing. Did you read about that? Where he like, yes. yeah, the reporter, I think he was just messing with him. I, the gun maybe wasn't loaded or s someone, there were some shenanigans up. But like, yeah, he apparently put this revolver to his head many, many times and fired it and, and lived. You know, Russian roulette style, obviously. Mm. Yeah, that's a bastardization of this theory of quantum immortality, which is that like your consciousness will basically exist in your body in the universe where you don't die in any situation where you would die, which theoretically means that your consciousness would be immortal, but also would imply that like everybody else, at some point you would live long enough that there would be no other real people in your universe. They would just be like husks of people. And like that poses a lot of philosophical questions about what consciousness is and isn't. And like, it's a really, really mind bending problem. Yeah. Also it's like people have legit died from Russian roulette. So it's not as if like, you can just be like, hell yeah, let's do this. And you know, and go for it. <laughs> I guess the idea though, is that if, if his body died, his consciousness would continue in a universe where his body didn't right, die. Right, exactly. But it's just like... But like... 
But are you going to get that? Such a philosoph- risk to take. Yeah. Too. Are you going to get that philosophical when you have a loaded gun in your hand? Like I guess some people are. John McAfee does. <laughs> Anyway, to the McAfee. <laughs> how, how do we get anyway, on this topic? Speaking of putting a gun to the head, the Divine Shadow tells one of his acolytes to shoot the other one, and she's like, "Okay, sure," and shoots him, and he's like, "Okay, now shoot yourself." And she's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, <laughs> Slow man!" Down here, like, <laughs> "Whoa, dude!" And he's like, "Do it!" And she's like, "All right, fine." <laughs> if you say so. Then the Divine Shadow decides to, I don't know, make the brilliant maneuver of reviving Kai as his personal <laughs> assassin to hunt down Stanley and also, like, Foden and Zev, I guess? I will say, one of my favorite aspects of the episode was that the Divine Shadow, like, kind of didn't know what he was doing. In any other show, this would be like a dark, evil, malevolent force who just was able to pull all the strings behind the scenes. But no, he's just some guy who's just kind of winging it. It's because they didn't clear his mind completely, so he still got elements of his original base persona. Yeah. He consults, like, all of the Divine Shadows before him for advice. You know, this is a common trope in sci-fi for beings that revive except in doctor who weirdly enough where like you consult your previous incarnations for advice they all exist as bra- as the mm-hmm. lobotomized brains <laughs> inside the lex which is the most powerful spaceship slash weapon slash penis ever devised do you notice the lex looks like a penis because it it looks like a penis to me it looked like a you know, a pair of compound eyes that, like, a fly might have well, or something. Well, yes, it's, you know, it's those... two large, big balls with a long <laughs> stick bit behind them. All right, well, yeah, I saw the bug... Maybe it was just the bug theme, but, like, yeah, I saw bug eyes and, like, a bug... I don't know what you would call it. Snout, uh, whatever, thorax. Is yeah. that what that little elongated mm-hmm. thing? Yeah, that's what I saw, but... uh yeah. Well, you know, the episode was just so sex crazed that it's hard to not see just a male sex organ. This episode's yeah, getting well, an explicit it's, tag. <laughs> well, it's it's both probably because it's like it's also so bug themed that you can also see probably what I saw. I don't think it's it's uh, too outrageous to say. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so th- th- um, Thod- Thoden wants to steal. The Lex. Also, somebody has the weirdest, like, pronunciation of projects in this episode. I don't know if you noticed this, Keon, but some guy says, like, (laughs) projects area. And I'm like, what? Canadians. Anyway, so... (laughs) Maybe we should revive the favorite low-budget special effect of the week for this show. When, when did we, we have, have that? We briefly on Blake 7, on Zenith. But my favorite low-budget special effect of the week is when Thoden, like, pulls out his eye, and his eye is clearly, like, some sort of cloaking device when it, like, blows up or activates. But, like, the actor who's playing Thoden reaches into his eye socket, pulls his, quote, eye, unquote, out, and you can see he's just, like, clearly got his eye closed and is holding a <laughs> fake eye in his hand. <laughs> and, like... Mm-hmm. It's so hilariously campy, but I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. I loved it. I'm not ragging on this because it's like bad or anything. I thought it was great. Yeah, yeah. But Kai is threatening Thodan, Thoden, I don't know, which is why he's doing this. And the eyeball explodes and like cloaks him but he doesn't move while he's cloaked so like kai just like shoots him and then he dies <laughs> and he's like oh yeah right before this i think we get a little bit more of stanley's backstory right where he's talking to thoden and his group and he like well they just really he... insinuate more that he's a traitor and like 94 worlds were destroyed because of him yeah I like that too. He's like this bumbling guy and he's like destroy Stanley Tweedle, destroyer of worlds. <laughs> Accidentally, as it's revealed later. I mean on. we find out later that 
that all of this happened because he provided like the cell line that the Lex was grown from. And like he so he didn't even have anything to do with the worlds being blown up. He just kind of like gave them some cells and they grew the Lex, which then blew a bunch of stuff up. Mm-hmm. But it was that he was part of some group that they were opposing, but he gave them what they needed. So that's why he's the traitor, right? Yeah, something like that. They get on the ship. The only people left now are Stanley, uh, Zev, uh, Jigarada, or Ziggurata, or whatever her name was. Jigarada. Yeah, it's and, with a G. And Kai. And the robot. Kai's guy. trying to kill Seven them. Four, four seventy, seven, 490. 490. God, I know these names too well now. That's <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, Kai is trying to kill all of them under orders of the Divine Shadow. Uh, but turns out sending him into the Hall of Brains in the Lex was like a bad idea. Uh, he uh, he basically just launches Jigurata off of, I guess, the bridge. <laughs> I have absolutely zero conception of the layout of the Lex. Like, yeah, neither. No, neither do I. So, I don't really know what happens, but he throws Jigurata off of something. I guess she's dead. I don't know. She's probably dead. So yeah, so they like Kai gets kicked off. He ends up in the Hall of Brains, and one of the brains is calling to him, and he's like, "What?" He picks it up, and then he regains all his memories because it was the brain of the Divine Shadow that killed him, and that Divine Shadow took all his memories when he killed him and had all the memories of every person he had killed. So now Kai has the memory of every person that that Divine Shadow ever killed, including himself, and that's when he remembers the prophecy that the last of the Brunin G would kill the Divine Shadow. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going through my notes, trying to remember what happened. Well, the the current divine shadow shows up and he's like, "Kill them, Kai." And he's like, "No, I know about the prophecy." And he's like, "You don't know that word." And Kai's like, "I do now." Uh, and then he's like, "Well, I failed. Guess I'll have to kill you myself." So they go to the Hall of Brains. It's definitely not called the Hall of Brains, but that's what I'm calling it. The Hall of Brains to fight, and then he just kind of stasis fields Kai. Kind of seems like he's way more powerful than Kai. Luckily for him, Stanley and Zev show up and just start smashing brains, which like great <laughs> Barbara style. <Yeah. laughs> I have a note here that's like, this is way too gratuitous for me. Thank you. That's a reference to how Barbara killed all the morphos in Keys of Marinus by smashing them all. <laughs> yeah. Check out Trust Your Doctor, a Doctor Who podcast. And uh, oh yeah, he like gets his memory back by like hearing the song we forgot to mention the like banging song that the Brun and G are singing as they fly to their death <laughs> called yo way o <laughs> which like the lex wiki has this great page on it where it says uh no 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 i don't want yo way o the episode there we go i want the song It says here, as a song frequently sung by Kai, the song is known only in an ancient, long-forgotten language of the Brunin G, and its exact translation and meaning are unknown. Thank you, Lex Wiki. Anyway, so then we get the most hilarious moment of acting prowess in the whole episode. (laughs) Because Kai goes... The divine predecessors will now die, and the divine shadow just goes in this exact tone. This is not a, this is not an exagger in this exact tone. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we may have underplayed it, but there's a lot of shoddy acting in this episode. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyway, we also forgot to mention that they're being chased by the Divine Shadow's personal flagship, the Mega Shadow. <laughs> the Mega Shadow. We also forgot the scene where Zev almost kills Stanley. We also forgot the scene where they blow up the the 
a plan the like outpost planet because they right. go to leave and they get stopped by an outpost and they're like what's your access code and he's like lex can you just blow up this outpost and lex is like all right can do chief well there's a bit of humor because it's like he's asking for the access code and like stanley's getting put on the spot just like he was putting the one lady on the spot earlier on <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It has to be on the other foot. Zev, who tells him to just blow the planet up, like he doesn't even come up with that solution on his own. Yeah. Anyway, they're like they're escaping while they're being chased during this whole thing. They're escaping to the secret coordinate that was hidden inside of Stanley's second tooth because the cell line the Lex was grown from was in his first tooth, but they didn't know about his secret second tooth, which Zev gets out of him by just decking him in the face. And then smashing his tooth. And just p- pulling it out. I, I've interpreted that as her, like, just ripping it out of his gums. Oh, I thought I thought she tried to pull it out and it wouldn't budge, so she punched him in the face and it went flying out. Well, maybe that's what it was, yeah. So they're going to the secret coordinate. Anyway, the, they, like, shoot the Divine Shadow and they're like, yay, we did it. But then, like, the Divine Shadow just, like, reanimates back at the the uh cluster so whoops i guess but that that's because the divine shadow had the foresight to lobotomize himself and accept the consciousness of the shadow into his brain instead of his own brain man we're really far into this episode i mean it all kind of makes sense right where it's like but yet we're saying and the divine shadow had the foresight to lobotomize himself before and it's just like imagine walking in on this conversation i have my window open imagine walking by like outside and being like what the fuck (laughs) this is like i don't know what doctor who discussion sounds like to non-doctor who fans (laughs) Where it's just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and yet it's clear as day if you've watched all the episodes. I think this episode is clear as mud still. Even though <laughs> yeah, I'm doing exactly. a pretty good job, I would say, of piecing together what happened. I still feel like I don't understand. No, yeah, this is like, this is, I mean, this is like molasses tier. Like you're swimming through, I don't know, just, yeah, molasses. Like, oh God, that's how... Uh, <laughs> That's what this is. And at this point in the episode, I was fairly zoned out, too, because I just was not enjoying it. Well, it's okay. We're almost over. Basically, what happens next is they go through the weird little portal thing and they pop out and God knows where. Literally, they're like, 490, take us back. And he's like, I don't know where we are. And Kai just comes in. He's like, we're in the dark realm now. Oh, yeah. By the way, my like fake blood that they used to revive me from dead like isn't going to survive isn't going to keep me alive forever so i'm going to go into cryostasis you know you know only wake me if you really need me and then he says this really cheesy line about i was the dark in the light and now maybe i can be the light in the dark and then the episode ends. exactly that's a that I, that's look right aspiring writers hear that line and just quit on the spot <laughs> they're just like not even going to try <clears throat> It's such a good line. Is it? <laughs> it's so, yes. It's, oh my God. I was the dark in the light zone. Maybe I can be the light in the dark zone. It's just like, yes, this made it all worth it. <laughs> I don't know if I would go that far. <laughs> no, neither would I. Except for the humor, which is what I just did. <laughs> All for the sake of the jokes. Maybe we have more in common and more to like about Lex than we thought, or I do, since I'm all for the sake of the jokes. Look, like I said. And have no integrity otherwise. Great. Great. <laughs> Look, I can. I, there are things to like here. The, like, high concept sci fi in this episode, you know, whatever high concept sci fi is, but just like. <laughs> The sci-fi concepts, let's say, actually is a better way to put it. The sci-fi concepts in this episode, I really like. I I think it's a really unique take on a sci-fi universe. Like, there are some unique things going on here, but also some send-ups of uh, classic sci-fi things. I'm just, like, I sit here confused because I don't know, do people like this earnestly? Do they think that this is actually good, or are they, like on the side of it's so bad it's good or they like it's so weird that it has to be good like i i i 
struggle to comprehend. I don't know. I mean, again, the two things, the two reasons, two biggest reasons I've seen for people liking this online, if, you know, they're to be believed, I guess. You can never read someone's mind, I guess. So just whatever people are posting online is like, they either like it because of the nudity and the sex jokes. It's not nudity, partial nudity, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently there is nudity later on. But uh, they either like it for that or just like it because it's really weird. That's what I've seen. Yeah, and that's what I've seen too. Very interesting. A lot of they all seem to agree that season three is trash and season four is even worse than that. Season three's premise we were just discussing before we started recording sounds really interesting, though. Probably more interesting than seasons one and two. Yeah, I mean, to me, because I was reading about them, it seems more interesting to me the premise. But I don't know if the execution is anything like. I worship his shadow. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, o- overall, yeah, like you said, there's there's good things about this. Overall, I definitely give it a thumbs down. Yeah, I have to fall on the side of disliking it more than liking it. Uh, yeah. Which, I don't know. We have three more episodes to go this season. Maybe we'll grow to love still, just how absolutely batshit insane it is. It can They can turn it around. They can turn it around, definitely. This episode had a lot to set up, being both the first episode of the show and trying to do its own episode of the week thing, it seems. Right. So they can definitely turn it around. I say as if the show is, like, new and airing. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> I do want to mention here, you know, honorable mention the 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 Lex wiki page on the Lex timeline. Just for just for like having the funniest line on any like fandom wiki I've seen yet. Just going to read the line verbatim. Uh let's see where is it? Ah oh, yes, by and is large it? organizing yeah. the Lex canon. Canon spelt wrong, by the way. Into a linear order is not as easy as it sounds. Relatively few hard dates are given, and they tend to be contradictory. <laughs> and then it just goes on and on and on. And then also, mm-hmm. like, let's not forget to mention that it like says some here somewhere here that it includes like the fan fiction book and the timeline. Like, yeah. why? <laughs> yes. Okay. So here I note as well. This is a quote from the Lex Wiki timeline page. I note as well, in a bout of self-referentiality, I've relied on previous essays and analysis, which appear in Lexplorations, Lexplorations, or in the official Lex Fan Club magazine, to be mischievous, also included, are the events of the fanfic episode, The Cluster. So yeah, the page is definitely as irreverent as the show. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm, the Lexploration Oh page. my god, just scroll through the timeline. Every single date has a question mark or just is a question mark. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Uh, season 2, physics suggests that gravity will distort space-time, creating different perceptions of time passing between observer and subject. It may be that subjective objective factors result in different time flows for travelers within the universes. And that's the thing, too, of, like, the show is throwing stuff like that at you, and then it's also throwing you into this world where, like, the timeline is really confusing and, like, it doesn't make sense and you don't, can't get a full grasp of anything and you're like, wow, this is, like, really shoddily made. And then you read something like that and you're like, oh, my God, like, no, no. <laughs> the season two where it's, like, episode duration, couple of weeks, question mark, a month, question mark, a couple <laughs> yeah. of days, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay the Lexploration site seems like it's going to be the anorak zone of lex so guess i'm going to okay, use that we should rely on forward. that yes yes oh man the way it was written i thought it was like some sort of um usenet group thing where it's like lexplorations lexplorations <laughs> Because you know how they have, like, I never used Usenet, 
obviously, but it's like, you know, they have like, what is it, whatever, like arts, media, or whatever it is, and it's like that, you know, it looks like a URL, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Oh man, the Lexploration site. <laughs> Don't you love the uh, <laughs> the scrolling text at the top? The like... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I guess it's not Britain's 10 actors for this show, is it? No, it's more like Canada slash Germany's 10 actors. <laughs> <laughs> Which is even more accurate than the Britain's 10 actors joke. Anyway, I looked up uh, Brian Downey as Stanley Tweedle. Apparently, he's been in pretty much all of... Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Oh, Paul Lex. Paul something's... <laughs> Paul, uh, Paul, Donovan. Paul Donovan's shows, or most of. Uh, his most famous role is in Hobo with a Shotgun, which is a movie I've heard of. And then I've heard of nothing else he's been in, but here's a few of them. Snow Angels, The Beachcombers, Millennium. Those are the ones that sound interesting to me. Oh, he was in he was in Sybil, but not the classic movie Sybil. The 2007 TV movie Sybil that I've never heard of. Oh. <laughs> Thrilling. That's not the... Maybe that's like a remake. You know the movie Sybil, right? Like the original one. I know of it. Yeah. So that's what I've got for Brian Downey. Oh, maybe this is... I don't know. I thought Sybil was from like the 70s or something like that. Right? I, I don't know. I genuinely Whatever. have no, I'm, no clue. I'm exceedingly curious. <laughs> but I'll continue on to not mess with the flow of the episode and keep time running in a circle. <laughs> oh, time is a flat circle. Anyway, Eva Haberman plays... Zev, she has a really extensive cruel. She well, what is that? She has a really extensive uh, career and lots of roles. Um, looks like mostly in German productions. Yeah, uh, like Immenhof, <laughs> Gegen den Wind. <laughs> you nail it. You Die keep going. <laughs> Rex, a cop's best friend. The hairdresser and the millionaire. Lex, huh? She was in Lex. Wow. <laughs> Tricked. Gr gr gross to Trevier. <laughs> it has that, um, you know that B that's pronounced as like an S, I, th I think? It's like a capital B, but not. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Zvi Profis. <laughs> I don't know why I'm all of a sudden so confident in pronouncing things when I've spent the last couple of years not being. You and me both. You and me both. Leibling lass uns scheiden. Personally, I'm a fan of under control. <laughs> oh, yeah. With troll as, the, yeah. as in T-R-O-L-L. -L. <laughs> Control four under control. <laughs> okay. And yeah, that's that's right. That's the German corner of the episode done. Uh, I've got uh, let's see Barry Bostwick as Foden, who I looked up because he's got an incredibly prolific career. Unlike the other, it seems to me like every guest actor on this show has a prolific career because we got Tim Curry coming up soon. Mm-hmm. But Barry Bostwick, he's acted on Broadway, he's acted in movies, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Moby Dick, the Hannah Montana movie, he's a voice role in Incredibles 2, Nancy Drooch, the original Charlie's Angels, the original Hawaii Five-0, Law & Order SVU, a TV show called Las Vegas, he's got a voice role on Phineas and Ferb, he was on Nip Tuck, he was on Psych, CSI, so yeah, lots of, yeah. Lots of little uh, TV roles there. Well, compared to him, Michael McManus, who played Kai's role, or acting career, rather, is a, a pretty pitiful, or pitifully small, or just really small. I guess it's not pitiful, it's just really not extensive. Um, he's only been in a couple things, mostly TV series. Adderley, The Squamish Five, no idea what that is. Top Cops, yeah, he was in Ooh. that. Alexander Graham Bell, The Sound and the Silence. Hmm. <laughs> the, the Sound and the Fury, no. Um... Hard to Forget, the TV movie. A mm -hmm. Taste of Shakespeare. Mm, just a little taste, a little sprinkling on top, you know, just a little 
Yeah. Lex is one of his last things that he was in. And then he was in the 2011 Blissstrasse, another German thing. <clears throat> then he hasn't <laughs> acted since. I really hope there are no Germans listening to this podcast. Listening to us butcher every German word that shows up. Well, as the title of this 1998 TV movie that uh, that Michael McManus was in asserts, Nothing Sacred, where he hmm. played Victor. <laughs> Victor. Great. That's all I had, actors-wise. Same here. That's all I've got. And that's all I had episode-wise, too. I had a few different things I wanted to talk about, but I think we hit on all of them throughout the episode. Yep. Same here. Well, tentatively looking forward to next week, if only to see if we can go down or up from here. And uh, no emails, so you can email us at the thedockerdecadervegetable.com questions, comments, concerns, and commands, love letters, your thoughts on Lex... You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. All at Inevitable with Lassie Sci-Fi Podcast. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook. Trust your doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast. And follow us on Twitter. And next time, we're going to be watching Supernova. But until then, the end. <laughs>